Section 51 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray. Section 51. Comparison of the Bones of the Hand and Foot. The hand and foot are constructed on somewhat similar principles, each consisting of a proximal part, the carpus or the tarsus, a middle portion, the metacarpus or the metatarsus, and a terminal portion, the phalanges. The proximal part consists of a series of more or less cubical bones, which allow a slight amount of gliding on one another, and are chiefly concerned in distributing forces transmitted to or from the bones of the arm or leg. The middle part is made up of slightly movable long bones, which assist the carpus or tarsus in distributing forces, and also give greater breadth for the reception of such forces. The separation of the individual bones from one another allows of the attachments of the interossei, and protects the dorsi palmar and dorsi plantar vascular anastomoses. The terminal portion is the most movable, and its separate elements enjoy a varied range of movements, the chief of which are flexion and extension. The function of the hand and foot are, however, very different, and the general similarity between them is greatly modified to meet these requirements. Thus the foot forms a firm basis of support for the body in the erect posture, and is therefore more solidly built up, and its component parts are less movable on each other than those of the hand. In the case of the phalanges the difference is readily noticeable. Those of the foot are smaller, and their movements are more limited than those of the hand. Very much more marked is the difference between the metacarpal bone of the thumb and the metatarsal bone of the great toe. The metacarpal bone of the thumb is constructed to permit of great mobility, is directed at an acute angle from that of the index finger, and is capable of a considerable range of movements at its articulation with the carpus. The metatarsal bone of the great toe assists in supporting the weight of the body, is constructed with great solidity, lies parallel with the other metatarsals, and has a very limited degree of mobility. The carpus is small in proportion to the rest of the hand, is placed in a line with the forearm, and forms a transverse arch, the concavity of which constitutes a bed for the flexor tendons and the palmar vessels and nerves. The tarsus forms a considerable part of the foot, and is placed at right angles to the leg, a position which is almost peculiar to man, and has relation to his erect posture. In order to allow of their supporting the weight of the body with the least expenditure of material, the tarsus and a part of the metatarsus are constructed in a series of arches, the disposition of which will be considered after the articulations of the foot have been described. The sesamoid bones, ossa sesamoidea. Sesamoid bones are small, more or less rounded masses, embedded in certain tendons, and usually related to joint surfaces. Their functions probably are to modify pressure, to diminish friction, and occasionally to alter the direction of a muscle pull. That they are not developed to meet certain physical requirements in the adult is evidenced by the fact that they are present as cartilaginous nodules in the fetus, and in greater numbers than in the adult. They must be regarded, according to Thelanius, as integral parts of the skeleton phylogenetically inherited. Physical necessities probably come into play in selecting and in regulating the degree of development of the original cartilaginous nodules. Nevertheless, irregular nodules of bone may appear as the result of intermittent pressure in certain regions, for example, the rider's bone, which is occasionally developed in the adductor muscles of the thigh. Sesamoid bones are invested by the fibrous tissue of the tendons, except on the surfaces in contact with the parts over which they glide, where they present smooth articular facets. In the upper extremity, the sesamoid bones of the joints are found only on the palmar surface of the hand. Two, of which the medial is the larger, are constant at the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb. One is frequently present in the corresponding joint of the little finger, and one or two in the same joint of the index finger. Sesamoid bones are also found occasionally at the metacarpophalangeal joints of the middle and ring fingers, at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb, and at the distal interphalangeal joint of the index finger. In the lower extremity, the largest sesamoid bone of the joints is the patella, 
developed in the tendon of the quadriceps femoris. On the plantar aspect of the foot, two, of which the medial is the larger, are always present at the metatarsophalangeal joint of the great toe, one sometimes at the metatarsophalangeal joints of the second and fifth toes, one occasionally at the corresponding joint of the third and fourth toes, and one at the interphalangeal joint of the great toe. Sesamoid bones, apart from joints, are seldom found in the tendons of the upper limb. One is sometimes seen in the tendon of the biceps brachii opposite the radial tuberosity. They are, however, present in several of the tendons of the lower limb. For example, one in the tendon of the perineus longus, where it glides on the cuboid, one appearing late in life in the tendon of the tibialis anterior, opposite the smooth facet of the first cuneiform bone, one in the tendon of the tibialis posterior, opposite the medial side of the head of the talus, one in the lateral head of the gastrocnemius, behind the lateral condyle of the femur, and one in the tendon of the psoas major, where it glides over the pubis. Sesamoid bones are found occasionally in the tendon of the gluteus maximus, as it passes over the greater trochanter, and in the tendons which wind around the medial and lateral malleoli. End of section 51 End of Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 1, by Henry Gray